Uh, got the last about 15, 20 minutes of your talk, and as always, exciting and entertaining and all those wonderful things. Um, as Mark said, that the title of this is, is Providing Five-Star Dentistry in a Discount World. And um, I have found over the years the talks I've given for students and dentists out there that I can give you all the philosophy I want, but unless I wrap it around a clinical topic, you're not very interested. So uh, we're going to use uh, a clinical topic today. It's uh, diagnosis and, and treatment of incomplete cusp fractures. And uh, it'll be kind of interesting, I hope. And, and what I want you to be thinking about is how you were trained in dental school to approach a treatment plan and how long you have been in private practice and how that has changed. Do you look at patients differently now? Do you look at their treatment plans differently? And most importantly, do you look at their diagnosis differently? So on the picture you see here, you look at that, that uh, upper first molar there, you see a, an amalgam that's gotta be 40 years old and you see the distal buccal cusp. There's probably a little crack right there along the that cusp ready to break off. And the first thing I'd ask is when should this tooth have been restored? If it's your mouth, when should this have been restored? Maybe 10 years ago? I mean, I wouldn't want that in my mouth. And uh, as we look at these cases, I want you to be thinking about that. If this were your mouth, and boy, that changed colors. Um, sorry about you that, still guys. It, bud. Uh, We'll just go on with this part of it. And that's just objectives and things that the school requires us to do. And you guys already are here for voluntary reasons and, and we'll, we'll keep going. So the incomplete tooth fracture. My thesis is that a lot of dentists frequently don't recognize the incomplete fractures of teeth. They often diagnose them incorrectly. They look at them, they say they're there, and they use that phrase that I've heard Dr. Hyman tell his students to never use a million times is, we'll just watch that. And to quote Dr. Pete Dawson, one of my mentors from many, many years ago who first got me interested in this topic, just what the hell are you gonna watch it do if you just watch it? And of course, sometimes they're treated improperly. Do you treat when you don't need to? Do you leave them alone? Okay, and we can't really see that. So I'm going to tell you, I don't know what's up with the, uh, the video here. <laughs> um, how many of you remember the Dallas TV show? Anybody old enough to remember that? And uh, J.R. and Bobby Ewing, the two brothers that, that uh, fought and battled all the time, J.R. was the, the worst thing in history, and everybody loved Bobby, mostly because he had a gorgeous wife. But Bobby was just so nice and so kind. I mean, he was the original Mark Hyman, and, and everybody liked him. And JR had, had leveraged the ranch, and they were going to lose everything as they did every week on TV. And JR and Bobby are screaming at each other, and Bobby says to JR, How could you do such a thing? And JR turns around and says, Once you sacrifice integrity, the rest is a piece of cake. <laughs> and that's what I want you to think about as you look at these cracked teeth. Most often, crown tooth in the mouth. Anybody know? The lower first molar. Why? Because it comes in behind the primary teeth. Mom doesn't know it's there. So oftentimes, it gets uh, decay in that tooth fairly early on. So as we think about this, one of the, the theses that I have here is that we should start treating teeth more conservatively earlier on. And I say that because if you got uh, a first year molar, so, you know, first molar, uh, it's got a big cavity in it by the time this, the kid's 15, let's say that filling lasts 15 years. The kid's now 30. You come out, you're going to do an onlay, maybe even a crown at 30. Let's say that lasts 15 years and they're 45. You're certainly going to come back and do a crown then if you did an onlay the first time. Now they're 60, 15 years later, and you're gonna come back and crown that tooth again at 60 to get them to 75. How many times can we do that to a tooth? And so I'm not saying crown every tooth that has a crack in it. One of the things I think we, we need to lean more on now is, as we work into dentistry is the digital possibilities. 
E4D and CIREC inlays and onlays, I think are a restoration that's horribly, horribly underused. We tend to rely on composite when we don't want to put a crown there and it's a large composite, so the composite shrinks as we cure it and that composite fails prematurely a lot of times. I've seen it over and over and over. Think about this, if you were to mill a resin or porcelain inlay and bond that into a tooth, you don't have near the volume of composite or the resin in there in terms of the shrinkage. And maybe we can treat these teeth with more conservative restorations that are bonded and not end up with crowns as early in life. Get them on down the road. My objective is to push them as far down the road as possible before we put crowns on. So we've got the lower molar. It's the first permanent tooth to erupt. Most often carries lesion in the mouth. And uh, each time you take a filling out, you take more tooth structure away. The research is very clear of that. And then you have the wedging effect of maxilla maxillary and mesiolingual cusp of the opposing tooth. So it tends to hit that tooth. If you haven't paid attention to the occlusion, you're going to be wedging the cusp apart on those lower molars. And then of course that crown is inclined lingually which weakens it if your occlusion is not the way you want it. It creates a sloping load. Uh, and I'm not getting any of my photos on here. Any idea what's going on? Well, uh, maybe, maybe back out of that, Keith, again, and then just try to restart it if for some reason. Okay, sorry. Um, it's all right. Let's see. Let's here. see hit the green button again and then see if it... Uh, Angie, any thoughts on that? I'm just wondering if the presenter view is um, messing it up. If if you didn't do a presentation, if you just pulled it up and saw it on the side, is it just a photo or a video? It's a, it's photos. Can you share Maybe you don't press in? play. Maybe you don't press play and just do it through the the PowerPoint or Keynote yeah. program. Can't get it off the screen now. I apologize. That's all right. Yeah, it happens. Hey. Oh. Just I rolling with it. Think of my screen now. Can you like force quit the application and then restart the, the program? Yeah, let me see here. Yeah, sometimes it's on presenter view. And sometimes Zoom is on a full screen, so if you press Escape, you can manage it a little bit better, too. Yeah. Let's see. All right. All right, hit the green button again, see what happens. All right, and I can't even see the green button at the moment. Yeah, that means you're probably in full screen. See if you can escape out of full screen. There you go. See, that looks great right there. Mm -hmm. All right. There you go. There we go. There's things I couldn't see before. You got it. Okay. There we go. We got it. Thank you. I appreciate the help. All right. So let's look carefully and critically at this case. What do you see up there? Now, this is a talk about diagnosing and treating incomplete cusp fractures. If this is your mouth, do you want anything done to that upper molar? How old do you think that amalgam is? It's got to be 25, 30 years old. First thing, do you see the crack running across this amalgam here and across right there? You see that? What about the crack down the side of the tooth here? Possibly here. What about this deep gray color in there? If that's your tooth, what do you want to do about it? I'm going to watch take it. it. You, what you're going to watch it do, yeah. So we've taken the amalgam out and I've just stained in there. So you got caries down underneath that. Now think about the, how did that amalgam crack? If it's on a solid surface, as you bite and chew, that amalgam cannot work hard and crack. There's got to be something soft under there somewhere for it to fracture across the top of that tooth like there, doesn't it? 
So if I see a crack running across an amalgam, I'm going to take that amalgam out virtually 100% of the time. And most of the time I find stuff underneath that that I don't want, that I don't like. And now look at that very thin wall there with decay underneath it, very thin wall back here. If that had been repaired or the, the amalgam replaced 10 years earlier, would we have lost all this extra tooth structure? Now, that being said, what do you think about these other amalgams now? I'm gonna probably take that amalgam and I don't like this little dark area on that tooth right there. So I'm in thinking beyond what I'm actually seeing there and saying, okay, how did this get here? And what are we gonna to do to stop it? Now, for the sake of evidence-based dentistry, a great article here, just sort of a, uh, that summarizes everything we were just talking about, that the mandibular molars are the first teeth to, to have these problems. Back in 1988, I graduated from dental school. I was a lab tech while I was in school. And so I did a lot of my own gold work early on in practice. This patient came in in about 1990 and the mesolingual cusp of this molar was broken off. Being the conservative dentist I wanted to be at the time, I adjusted the occlusion on that lingual cusp. I skirted this with the onlay and I made a gold onlay that I made myself. I was really proud of it. Patient comes back in 1994 and something's hurting now. And I've learned some things between the early, the late 80s and the mid 90s. And now I look back and I see this deformed amal amalgam back here. I see this dark area underneath there. I see, is this a crack here? And I'm thinking, wow, let's take that amalgam out. Now you see when you take the amalgam out, a crack horizontally across the floor of the prep and out the lingual. And in 1994, I had to ask myself, when I did the crown on the first molar, why did I ignore this? Would I have lost that cusp if I had done this back in four years previously, if I had looked at the entire mouth. And further, what does it take in the anterior for this to occur in the posterior? What if your anterior guidance is wearing because your canines are now worn, letting the posterior teeth hurt and hit in excursive movements? So maxillary molars, how often do you see a cusp broke, buccal cusp broken off on a maxillary molar. Again, one of the more common things is the anatomy of the tooth, the potential wedging effect of those tough, big buccal cusp on lower premolars. Uh, and they got a big clinical crown and those little buccal cusp out on the outside of the tooth. So we see this pretty often. Take a look at this just a moment. Again, you see a fracture starting across the amalgam here across here, out the distal wall here, and something going here on the mesial. So I'm gonna take the amalgam out and see what's in it. But what else do you see on that tooth that concerns you? What about this area right here? Then what about this virgin premolar? Do you think maybe we need to evaluate the anterior guidance on this patient in order to protect whatever we do on that tooth? Make sense? So, again, I think there's a lot of cases that we leave untreated that should be treated. There's a lot of cases that we treat and we should question should it be treated or at least how you treat it. And we don't want to be guilty of doing non-conservative treatment. Does every tooth have a crack in it need a crown? No. But I would contend that if a crack goes into Denton, we certainly want to treat the tooth somehow. And there's that quote from J.R. Ewing, once you sacrifice integrity, the rest is a piece of cake. It is your decision to make ethically combined with talking with that patient. Now, what you're looking at here is the windshield of my wife's brand new Sequoia. Late one night, one of our elderly neighbors called and said, I've got to go to the emergency room. Can you take me? It was storming horribly. 
Uh, I had not even driven this car before, just gotten it from my wife. I said, can I take your car because our neighbor is elderly, she can't get in my Ford F-350 diesel pickup truck. So Kim said, sure. I took off from the emergency room at 80 miles an hour and on the highway with it rain raining like crazy, bam, something hits the windshield. I had other things on my mind. I took her on to the hospital and I was sitting there. I was thinking, I wonder what hit that windshield in the middle of the night. Got up the next morning, went out and looked, and here's this break in the windshield. Now, I took a picture of it. I went in quickly and told my wife, I really like driving your car, but I want to get it all cleaned up. You mind if I take it to work? Because I'm going to get this windshield changed before she even sees it. She isn't going to know about it. So she said, sure. And I took this picture, called the insurance company, and, and I started looking at the picture. And so you see where the rock hit. You see the cracks going in three different directions. What are you going to watch it do? Yeah, it's not going to get better. It's not going to heal. I prayed over this intensely. It didn't get any better. But look at the little specks here in this windshield. What are those? They're little imperfections in the surface of that glass that you don't see with your naked eye. You only see it when you take a photograph of it, when you magnify it, when you put light on it, when you look at it carefully. Well, you're now looking at the back door of my office. This car is sitting outside in the summer sun, and I go out at lunchtime, and this little crack on the right has now grown across the windshield, and I'm not going home until this windshield is replaced. And I took another picture. And it's been sitting under a flowering cherry tree and there's bird schmutz and stuff on it from a different angle. Lights reflecting off it differently. Where did the crack go? All of us sitting here know that crack is still there. You just can't see it because of all the crud on the windshield, a direction that, you know, the light's just not being kind to your eyes. You're looking at it with your eyes and our teeth are the same way. So you gotta find ways to look at these teeth using cameras, using intraoral cameras, handheld cameras, translumination. You got to clean the teeth off. You got to dry the teeth. You got to look at all those things. So how significant is a crack? It's not really a big deal until this breaks, is it? So these are some of the things I have used and tried over the years. I dry the teeth well after I've cleaned them off. I use direct light. I use indirect light. It's amazing the difference in what you see when you do that. I use a fiber optic light to transluminate the teeth. I use magnification. Your cameras now will do that for you. I used to have a screw on lens on the front of my camera so I could get down to about four inches away from the tooth to look intensely into the tooth. The test bite. I never had much luck with a burlu wheel. I always use a tooth sleuth now. The staining, I had almost no success with that. If it were broken bad enough or to show up with a stain, typically it, it, I didn't really need the stain on there. And so I just don't use the stains very much. But you gotta look carefully. You need to look at teeth, all these different directions, all these different ways, so that you know what you're looking at. So here's the tooth. This is back in the days of the early intraoral cameras. One of the first, this is a VHS image, and we thought those images were fantastic back in 2000. Patient came in, this tooth was asymptomatic. Here in my exam, dried it off, and I see a fracture line in the mesial and the distal of a lower first molar. I'm concerned about the tooth. My experience tells me a lot of teeth that are broken like that are lost. I suggested to the patient that we take this amalgam out and look and see where that crown goes. And she said, no, the tooth's not bothering me. We'll deal with it when it hurts. In 2002, she came back in and there's the tooth now. So what did we watch it do? I saw a question earlier, uh, what do you do when the patient uh, says, you know, I only want a cleaning and uh, you think I need perio scaling? Well, this is the same kind of thing. It's the patient's decision, showed her the photograph, talked to her about my concerns, and each time she came into hygienist, we put this film back up, we talked about it, but two years later, she's now lost a tooth because we did not go in and take that amalgam out. I use intraoral photography for, for all kinds of things to talk with patients about the, the cases, see how things look, what they're gonna do. 
uh, what things might look like when we finish and, and uh, just valuable, valuable things. Use your cameras for everything. And the integral cameras are so good now that it's just amazing what you can see that you, you don't see otherwise. Uh, handheld cameras are not really all that necessary. It's amazing what you can get with a good uh, camera phone now. But I use translumination, I would say when I'm seeing new patients, uh, six out of 10 patients. I'm gonna pick up a, a light and I'm gonna shine it through a tooth and try to evaluate it. I saw this in a, a uh, rock shop up in the mountains of North Carolina. This is Rose Quartz. Had a light bulb in the center of it. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. This demonstrates translumination better than anything I can do. This crack that shows up right along here is only visible when that light's on. And you're shining light through crystals. So if there is a crack that separates a space between the crystals, it will deflect the light and it'll look like that. It does the same thing in a tooth when a crack goes into dentin. So if you look at this tooth, is this area a mesial of an upper premolar? You know there's a big mesial flute on that tooth. You know it often will have two roots. Is that a crack? Or is that just part of that fluke that comes up across the, the marginal ridge there? The other thing I worry about here is the gray color down inside that crack. When I see that, it makes me more concerned. So I've got a three millimeter tip with a green light, which is my personal favorite. Obviously, it's not going to go through where there's an amalgam, but you see on the side of this tooth that it's going through the enamel and the dentin to right here and then it stops. There's no light that gets through to the lingual and palatal portion of that tooth. That tooth has a crack in it. How do we treat it? Well, I don't know yet, but I'm going to try to show that to the patient. I'm going to talk about, we're going to take that silver filling out of that. And we're going to look and see where that crack goes. I'll tell them the possibilities. I'm concerned about those upper premolars because of those two roots. Does that crack go down between the roots? If so, we're going to lose the tooth no matter what we do most of the time. If it doesn't, the tooth may well need a crown or a cap to cover that tooth and hold those pieces together. Possibly a filling, I don't think so, but possibly. So they have all bases covered and we'll make that decision together. Once we take the filling out, we'll look at it with the internal camera together and we'll talk about it. And I've always taken at this point, I'll do my pre-op or my scan or my impression to make a provisional just in case. If it doesn't need a crown, the patient's thrilled. If it does, they expected that. Now, as we go a little further into the decision-making process, part of the research I did way back when was a pathogenesis and size, and size aware. And I never really thought about it. And nobody talked to me about this in school. Um, but generally, you'll start seeing wear because of lateral movements. You start seeing the canine starting to flatten off at that, that incisal edge. As the anterior guidance, the, the lift of the canines decreases because of that wear, and they go into complete crossover. Now, Henry Murray, my occlusion instructor in dental school, probably talked to me about complete crossover in dental school, but if he did, I missed it. But it's an incredibly powerful place when you go to the incisal edge, right cusp tip of canine to canine, and then keep going, and your central laterals start, centrals start touching next, and then your laterals. So if you go into complete crossover, an amazing number of people uh, will brux at night in complete crossover, and you see these chipped edges on the teeth that match up perfectly, and it has to be in crossover. So you're gonna see the canines, the centrals, then the laterals in that order starting to wear and crossover is often something you have to consider. It took me a number of veneer cases to realize that if you don't check your veneers in complete crossover and they're bruxing in complete crossover, they're going to break those veneers if, you're, if you don't protect them. So if you look at this smile, patient is 48 years old. If you look at the incisal edges, there's a little, little thinning here on the inside. The patient says they don't grind, but they clench and rub around kind of eccentric. They're very much aware of that. 
So do I protect this with a night guard at 48 years old? You might consider this appropriate, age appropriate wear. But let's look back in the back a little more closely at some of the other teeth. So there's a crown back here. We don't know why. These cuss tips look pretty good. Looks like there should be pretty good anterior guidance there, but here's the occlusal surfaces of the posterior teeth. Now what do you see? Well, let's look at the, the second molar first. Is this a crack through here? Well, I don't know, but look at the color of this cuff compared to all the others. See how this is just a little more opaque? That leads me to believe that I have a horizontal fracture under that cusp. Fractures coming down the marginal ridges, a crack running across this amalgam here. The amalgam is deformed back here. Non-desirable lingual range contact here and a crack running down the distal. How about the first molar? You see these other cracks, craze lines? Are they significant cracks? Are they significant craze lines? How are you gonna make that decision? Well, in my book, I'm gonna make sure I take this amalgam, and again, a crack running across of this amalgam, down the lingual, out the mesial, questionable about the buckle here, I saw just the buckle, I might not think about restoring that as aggressively as I would if those are proven to be cracks. But I often ask people, how did we get these divots in this tooth? What's the pathogenesis of that? How does it happen? Think about the shape of enamel rods on the cusp tips. So if the patient grinds through the cusp tips, through the enamel into the dentin and they have a high acidic, highly acidic diet, the acid is going to erode and create that little cup there. They can't fight down at the bottom of that cusp. There's no occlusion in there. So you got to consider the diet, you got to consider the anterior guidance, and you got to consider the habits here. This is the upper molar. Interesting case, somebody's been grinding on this tooth. Patient said they ground that because something started hurting back there and they ground it off and it made it feel better. That was a definitive treatment. I wonder about the crack right here in that tooth. But again, it's not this tooth, it's the entire process of the mouth. What's the pathogenesis of that? Now look at this case. You got periodontal disease, you got all kinds of recession. You see the anterior teeth with pretty severe wear. And you can tell if this patient went into complete crossover, these centrals are going to be hitting over in here somewhere. These incisal edges match up perfectly, but look at the wear on that canine especially. This patient is 27 years old. If you don't intervene in that patient's mouth and do something about the anterior guidance to protect that, that patient's not going to have their teeth. Even if you fix all the perio, those teeth aren't going to be there when they leave this world. So, interesting case. This is Danny, um, and this is just uh, something that I had to think about. I'm working in, in uh, the Amazon River Basin in Brazil here, and uh, I just have to question every time I treatment plan a patient, would I do it on me? Here's Danny. When you see Danny over here on the left, this is the way Danny is unless you absolutely force him to smile. I came into work one morning, Danny's sitting at the, in the front, and he's swollen down here. Not really hurting, but swollen. He's aware of something wrong. He's seen this before. Uh, so we get Danny in, you look at his bite, and you say, smile for me, Danny, big full smile, and you have to force him to do that. And you say, wow, he's got some pretty severe wear. I'll tell you more about Danny in a minute, and you'll realize the challenge of getting these photographs with, with Danny. But you see these lower anteriors, looks like they've all got some composite on there. They've all had endo. Danny is wearing through these teeth one at a time. And root canals have been done in each of those teeth one at a time over several years. Danny was a patient at the VA and he wants to know, he's got a new girlfriend now and he wants to know why nobody's ever fixed his teeth because he wants them to look better. Now, mind you, Danny can chew nails if he wants to. He's an ex-Marine, or he's a Marine. There never is an ex-Marine. Uh, Danny is tough. You can see the buttressing bone 
up here and a completely closed bite. It's kind of a restorative nightmare at this point in Danny's life, just if this were just a technical case on an ideal patient. Here's the mounted models. You can see, trying to work through the plan on this. And let's look at his medical history together. Just gonna focus on just the ones that are in blue. Danny has severe PTSD. If you drop a tray of instruments behind Danny, he's coming up out of that chair and he's ready for a fight. Got pretty significant osteoarthritis. He doesn't use a cane, but mostly because he's too proud to. He has fairly significant bouts of depression. He doesn't sleep well. He's got neck pain, got alcohol dependence. And then the one that starred obsessive compulsive disorder, when Danny walked into the operatory, he had to face away from the chair. He'd square up like he was at attention, facing away from the chair. He would turn in a circle, back up to the chair and sit down very rigidly. He would then rotate around, put his feet up, lay his head back and open his mouth and never say a word. And you could not interrupt that or he started the entire process over. Now the real challenge of working with Danny is that he could only maintain that for about two minutes at a time. Danny had the worst gag reflex of anybody I've ever seen. So getting pictures, getting impressions were an absolute nightmare for the staff and for Danny and for me. Uh, it was a real challenge. And I'm thinking, how am I gonna restore this case two minutes at a time? Because when I work for two minutes, Danny has to stand up and go through that routine and sit back down to survive. He cannot change that. Danny's got a bit of myofascial pain disorder and he's got early onset Alzheimer's disease. So thinking about what you saw in uh, Danny's photos and on those models, how are you going to approach this case? Dental findings, his perio health is good except for some isolated problems with, uh, with vocations on teeth. We'll see in just a minute. Bruxine clenching, uh, it's got attrition, abrasion, erosion, muscles. You saw his cheek muscles, big, strong, masticatory muscles. He doesn't complain about his joints hurting, but he says they get sore sometimes. And he's got an acquired class three bite at this point. Here's Danny's pan. So you see these anterior root canals that have all been done one at a time over years. Now he's got root canals back here, Vercation's a problem up here, down here, and so we really don't have a tremendous amount to work with. Can you crown lengthen these teeth and put cast posts and cores maybe in them? And we were thinking all kinds of possibilities. What are you going to do in the back? So we tried. I made a lower occlusal splint, splint, which is what I do for most of my patients. I make them on the bottom. They're easier to adjust because you got canines and posteriors and complete crossover. It's the only thing you have to adjust. The upper, you have to adjust that full range of anterior guidance to get that adjusted properly. I got the impressions. I got the, the guard in there. Danny couldn't tolerate it for more than two minutes. We made an upper one. He thought that might be better. No better at all. Made it on the same set of models. So we've tried two night guards. Neither one worked. I thought, well, okay, let's make Danny an over partial on the bottom. I made one. He couldn't tolerate it. Another dentist at the VA, been in practice about 35 years, was a <clears throat> removal specialist. He made an over partial of a different design. Danny couldn't tolerate either. So, his complaint, having your girlfriend, I hate my smile, I want the smile to look better, and he thinks the VA isn't doing anything because it's gonna cost so much. So Danny went to see an oral surgeon in private practice and got a quote. An oral surgeon and a prosthodontist that were going to fix Danny's teeth, $73,000. They were going to take out all of Danny's teeth and put in implants. Any concerns about that? Well, here's my concerns. I've tried to make bite opening appliances, two different designs, two different partials, and Danny couldn't tolerate either any of the four objects. 
Right now, he has no problems whatsoever with speech or chewing. And if we take Danny's teeth out and put implants in, somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder, severe OCD, and he can't tolerate the bridges or the overdentures or even the implants, Danny is now a dental cripple and he's gonna eat baby food the rest of his life. The obsessive compulsive disorder, I've never seen anything quite like it. Longest patient could maintain being in the office at any one time is one hour. It's got the profound nocturnal bruxing habit, so anything we put in there, I'm gonna worry about after the fact. Danny talks to you with his teeth together. He clenches all the time. He never opens his, his mouth when he speaks. Multiple providers have explained the challenges of the case, the expense of the aesthetics, uh, not really an, an issue for the VA. I could have approved this to be done outside, but I had trouble with the ethics of this. What if we're making Danny a dental cripple? So there's a review of the case. Outcome is pretty cool. Um, I left the VA before I was able to get final pictures of Danny, but he did come by to show me. Danny at our last meeting brought his new girlfriend in. Both were in tears when they got there, wanting something to be done. His girlfriend, I talked to her independently, and she said, he's driving me absolutely crazy. He's obsessed about this, something has to be done. So we talked again and we reviewed with our chief president the, the challenges of this case and if the implants are something he can't tolerate, the denture that he will have to wear during, during, during a healing phase, he can't tolerate that. He's going to eat baby food the rest of his life. And then he says, I understand that. And I said, but I can't in good conscience turn you into a dental cripple unless you can prove to me you're gonna be able to tolerate this. So our agreement, I made Danny a night guard, a new night guard, and he had to agree to wear that every day and every night for six months. If he did that, then I would sign off on this case. Danny looked at me square in the eye and said, I'm a Marine, I'll do it. And by God, he did it. <laughs> so we signed off on a $73,000 case. They placed, they took the teeth out, put in immediate dentures, and Danny came by to show me his dentures. And he said, I can do this. I've gotten used to them. I'm gonna be able to do this. Got the implants placed, wore the, the denture the entire time the implants were healing had the abutments placed, turned them into overdentures, and, and that's when I lost Danny. But he was, the success was putting Danny in position to prove to himself that he could manage this and to me. And so since this time, I've had a chance to, to speak with a, a psychologist here at the school about this case. And we're we'll talking about OCD with students and doing our inquiry case-based learning. But I don't know, you've probably all seen the movie Patch Adams. I showed it to our fourth year dental students and we had a talk about this. I, I love the scene where Patch is in the courtroom uh, about to lose his license and, and uh, one of the members of the board says, what if one of your patients had died that you'd been treating in your clinic outside of, uh, of standard medical care? He, says, he turns to the group and he says, as a doctor, you treat a disease, you win, you lose. If you treat the person, I guarantee you win every time. And that's the classic quote for somebody like Danny, as challenging as that case is. Now let's look at this. Look at the occlusion on this case. The patient came in. I was the third dentist they have seen. There's something up here hurts when I bite. It's only when I bite down and let back up that it hurts. We look up there, you've got virgin teeth all the way back through here. It's a bit of a wear facet here, possibly. Deep groove across the center of the tooth. And I marked the occlusion. You see the wedging effect on both of these teeth and the lingual range function that's non-desirable on the molar. There was one little place I could get sort of a stick right there. 
So I started that cleaning that groove out. And as I cleaned the groove out, I realized this groove. And for the life of me, I don't know why I didn't transluminate this too. But we see a fracture line running across this two rooted tooth from mesial to distal. My first comment was to the patient, that crack is there. I can't do anything about it. We're going to lose that tooth no matter what we do. And he said, no, we're not. Not until we've tried everything. And I said, what do you mean? I said, we're not taking my tooth out until it hurts and we've got to take it out and there's no other option. I said, well, we can put a crown on that tooth, but I think you're throwing your money away. Now, there was not a deep probing pocket here, anything on any side of that tooth. But as we prep the tooth, here's what we were left with. You can see the crack clearly running all the way through the tooth. I stained it. This is decay. I took a small carbide burr, cleaned this out, and restored it with composite, put a crown on it. And for eight years after that, every time he came into hygiene, the first thing he said is, crown's still there. Fooled you, didn't I? And to my knowledge, that too still there. So uh, just the, the message that, uh, you know, let's not jump to conclusions so often. Uh, he was willing for him, it was worth the cost of a crown to give this tooth a try. And we went into that together. And I told him, I said, you know, if this thing fails in a year, I'll give you half of what you've got in the crown off of whatever we do to replace it, whether it's an implant or a bridge or whatever we do, but I'll, I'll go into this with you if it means that much to you, it means that much to me. To kind of wrap up, this is an interesting case of how important is a crack in a tooth and that you have important is to look at the whole patient. This is the wife of a neurologist. I've known these, this couple, treated their whole family, their kids there for, for years, and she calls me at three o'clock in the morning before she can get through talking. Her husband's on the phone saying she's got a tremendous toothache, but what I'm worried about is she is profoundly numb, lower right quadrant, cheek area. The neurologist wants to know what's wrong. So I run to the office to see the patient. We get this film, and, and she indeed... I think I could, have, I could have taken my explorer and gone through her cheek into her gums and she would have never felt it. It was profoundly numb, not just tingly. So we get this, this picture and it looks like, okay, there's a um, little bit of decay back here. Maybe an old buildup pulp cap of some kind there, but Certainly it's a periapical thing. So I say, okay, we're going to open this tooth for a root canal and you're gonna get comfortable. So I open the tooth up and there's this strange color pus coming out. Sort of a yellowish looking stuff and kind of granular, but it drained really well. And I cleaned it all out of there real well and said, okay, you're numb now. You're gonna feel better when you get up in the morning. This numbness wears off. I also need to tell you that she has severe Crohn's disease and has for many years. She's now down to practically no bowel. Any surgery she has beyond this and she's going to a colostomy. Uh, challenging case because if you put her on antibiotics or oral antibiotics, they destroy her gut and that triggers these uh, uh, Crohn's disease kinds of problems. So, but I felt fairly confident that if, if we just opened this up and got it to drain it, she would be comfortable. She came back in the next morning, still profoundly numb and hurting just as much as she was the night before. Said, okay, we're gonna kind of clean this out and see what's going on down here. We open it up and there's a crack that runs mesia distally all the way through the tooth. And there was a little bit of decay here on the distal. Not a lot, but the crack's there. I said, we're gonna take the tooth out we did. I said, now you're going to feel better. She came back a couple days later, so hurting so much, I couldn't even get the uh, a film down there. That's the best we could do no matter what we did. Now, her husband's still worried about the profound numbness, and I gave him the line about, okay, it's just infection. It's around the mental nerve. We would certainly expect this to get better over time. We just got to clear this infection up. I sent her to uh, Dr. Mike McKee, an outstanding endodontist in our area, to check out the, uh, the premolar and the molar behind it, see if there's something else going on that I'm missing. He couldn't find anything. By the time she got through the, uh, the endodontist, we sent her uh, 
to an oral surgeon who looked around. And by the time she got to the oral surgeon, it was about a week and a half later, the extraction height had site had completely closed over. It looked like it had been closed for three or four weeks after a week and a half. It was absolutely amazing how much it healed. So the oral surgeon didn't find anything, went a couple more days and his wife, his, or the neurologist started treating her with IV antibiotics in the back of his office uh, every day. And uh, she was not getting better. She was getting progressively weaker as time went on. Nothing was working. The endodontist called me out of the blue one day and his voice was shaking. He said, one of my best friends from Texas just called. He's an endodontist, best endodontist I know. And he's getting sued for something that sounds so close to what you're describing. We have to check this out. Anybody got a guess? They hadn't seen this before. <laughs> Turns out that the endodontist is being sued for a case and the part that made it sort of strange to everybody, put it all together, was that tissue healing so quickly over the top of it. This was a case of actinomycosis. The... Uh, <clears throat> The key to this was the sulfur granules that make the pus a distinctly yellow color and gives it kind of a gritty, sandy feel. That I didn't know that at the time. I remember talking about actinomycosis in dental school, but I never put that together. And the, the key here is you've got a cracked tooth. That bug is in your mouth all the time, but unless it can get to a place where it can thrive in an anaerobic environment, it's not a problem such as a cracked tooth or an area decay. It has to have that portal of entry into a tooth. And this lady, once we treated her for actinomycosis and she got better remarkably quickly and, and it formed, turned out to be a, a wonderful experience uh, looking back on, I learned so much. I remember something Dr. Jeff Burks, I'm sure Mark remembers Dr. Burks well. Uh, he used to close each of his lectures uh, with a comment, a tooth is a tooth, but a life is something much, much more. So another periodontist friend of mine, uh, I leave you with the comment that it's all about helping others always, as Ken Peavy says. I think if you're going to practice dentistry in a discount world and you want it to be five star, you owe it to your patients to be better at diagnostic, by diagnostics, to be better at conservative restora restorations, but most importantly, to look at the cause of everything you're restoring. How did it get there? Why is it there? And do I need to intervene in the occlusion or in the, the uh, type of restoration we use? All those kinds of things factor in to your decision about how to treat the tooth. And I leave you with the final comment that the Whittium rule, I think it was Jim Pride that told me that many, many years ago, it's would I do it on me? And you use that as a decision-making process uh, to decide how you treat the person and not just the tooth like we were taught in dental school. All right, any questions at all? You make us proud, young man. <laughs> that was outstanding as always. Comments out, out the wazoo. I wish I could have heard this lecture when I joined the Army five years ago. He's teaching five years of tough lessons in an hour. I wish all young dentists were able to hear this. Very proud. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions? It was outstanding. I think there was a question on the transillumination. What, what are you using the tool for that? Well, they make Green all light. sorts of, the, what we're using in school now is just a battery powered transilluminator that's rechargeable, sold just as a transilluminator and it is outstanding. The only thing I don't like about it is it's white light, and that can be difficult to see with your overhead lights on. Uh, I had one that was just a three millimeter tip with a green light. That was my personal favorite. I got it from Henry Schein, gosh, probably 25, 30 years ago. Uh, you can do it, I guess. I have on in a pinch with uh, just a curing light, but of course, then you got to look at the light and it, you can't really take much time to, to look at it and it's impossible to get photos with it. Uh, there is uh, Mark, uh, the camera, uh, you want to mention that that has a... The we, we spoke about Digidoc having the Loom, L-U-M, which is a trans illuminator and the camera takes the photo of it. And then you have the documentation of the mesial distal cracks of caries. 
it's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful thing. I highly recommend that. First time I saw that, that was that was a, the sales point for that particular integral camera for me. Great. What else? And then the actinomycosis treatment that you did. Yes. What was the treatment uh, for that? We opened that uh, surgical site up again. The oral surgeon did an anaerobic culture and came back uh, actinomycosis. But he then, treated it completely at that point. And uh, like I say, it was, it was a matter of this patient was in serious trouble if we didn't do something. And we were just lucky and put it all together. I have a question for you, Keith. Um, so, so a dentist takes your, the philosophy you're, you're discussing, which I hope everyone does, and then they've been seeing for the patient for maybe 10, 20 years. What would be the best approach to kind of say, okay, now I'm going to go in your mouth and look differently at your mouth, and I found all these things that need to be done. And then they look at you and go, oh, you're just trying to pay your COVID bills, you know? So uh, like what would be your approach just for, you know, younger dentists to say, okay, uh, what, what's the best way to go in here with that kind of evidence? Yeah. Erwin Becker taught me um, many, many years ago because I was in a practice. Dad and I together had almost 10,000 patients in the practice at that point, and I was exhausted. Dad was exhausted. We had to do something really, really differently to survive. And uh, in that process, there was this group of patients that I really, really loved working on. And there was a huge group of patients that I just really didn't want to see anymore. And, and uh, so Erwin said, you know, part of the problem is you've become an emergency dentist. All you're doing is putting out fires. And, and I brought up that very point. You know, I got these people I've been seeing all this time, and now I'm seeing cracks. I'm seeing occlusal disease. I'm seeing things far beyond what I knew when I got out of dental school. And he kind of laughed. He said, I'm going to give you a phrase I want you to never forget. When you see these patients in hygiene, you say, Miss Jones, you know, what I'm seeing now are some changes taking place in your mouth. I'd love your, your permission to schedule an hour, an hour and a half for us just to look around together and see what we find. I'm concerned about some of the changes and we may need to come up with a plan that's more fitting for you at this point in your life. We would schedule it. Then you essentially got a new patient sitting there and you've said, we've been watching some of these things. I see some changes now. And that puts it in a context that they seem to be able to deal with. The other phrase that I learned at that point was uh, when patients don't need to be your patients, uh, patients are right, always right, but they don't have to be your patient. It's let me help you find a good dentist that can provide the kind of care that you're looking for. Very friendly way. You're not telling them they're stupid or they're horrible and you don't want to see them. It's let me help you find a good dentist. And you can always find somebody that matches with their personality. That's so profound. I mean, I think we all can learn from that one. Um, I, I've taken a lot away from this lecture, just especially as a young dentist. I appreciate a lot of the the really big lessons that you've learned. I think one from Peter, he mentioned, how would you manage buyer's remorse, I guess he used, is when you take an asymptomatic tooth, treat it, and then it becomes symptomatic. <laughs> I think we've all been there, right? <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. And uh, it's interesting, we're, we're creating inquiry case-based learning cases for our students in our new curriculum at Chapel Hill. And that is one of the cases, starts off with, I've treated them, why do they hurt? The first thing is, most of the time, my assumption is it's occlusion. I left a filling too high and it hurts right away. Um, once in a while, one of the, the things that started me on this, this uh, internal crack kind of thing is a patient, one of my first patients, I did an MOD amalgam on them upper premolar, they came back the next day and this thing's killing me. I didn't know what it was, so I got my dad. I said, I'm going to bring some gray hair in on this. We were in practice together, and dad looks at it and says, I don't know. Take that filling out and look inside. I said, oh, wow, what a novel idea. I just put the filling in, and I was proud that I did a maxillary premolar using the mirror, and you want me to take it back out. I took it back out, and there was a big horizontal fracture in the tooth, and I had to tell the patient, now we need a crown. And in that case, I did the crown for nothing because I figured it was my fault. I didn't know, but I learned. So I, I, I uh, you know, part of this is it's not always going to go the way you want. So much better now that we have great dent and bonding agents and, and 
products that we can we can use to to cut down sensitivity, post-op sensitivity. Um, the problem I find most often though is I didn't pay attention to the occlusion. Either it's it's excursion, centric excursion, or a complete crossover. And most of the time, it's getting over in a complete crossover where I'd missed something that caused a problem. Awesome. Well, thank you, Keith. We appreciate you, buddy. Thanks so for having me. So glad to have you today. So Great to you if anybody has any questions about what we're doing at the dental school in terms of infection control and COVID, be happy to come back and cover that for you sometime. But thank you That'd for having me. Too. I'm honored to be here. Great group of people. And thanks for what you're doing, guys. Mark. Thanks.